Next up is Paul Hagstrom. He's going to share the state of the Apple III in 2020. He'll describe how some of the, the, the modern, modern solutions and peripherals work with the Apple III. Paul? Hello, welcome to the Apple III in 2020. So um, the idea here is essentially that um, the Apple III has become relatively easy to use in modern times, and I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about uh, why, you know, the ways in which it is easier. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm actually sort of talking about here are modern improvements, uh, and the categories of things that I will talk about are the power supply, video, translation, drive emulation, Wi-Fi modems, uh, Ethernet, and just emulation on, on you know, computers like that one. Uh, OK, so the first thing I'll talk about is the power supply. Um, that's one of the things that I think is one of the uh, main things that keep me, at least, from using Apple Threes, is that I'm always worried that the next time is the time when I turn it on and my office fills with stinky smoke. Um, these power supplies, the original power supplies, are kind of notorious for um, blowing these Rifa capacitors. Uh, and Reactive Micro has made a universal power supply that fits in all, you know, like lots of different Apple models, Apple IIs, Apple II Pluses, Apple IIes, Apple II GSs, um, but also the Apple III, which I think was very cool of them, uh, that they they included that. So if you, the way this works is you get uh, this kind of like green board that has some perforations on it, and you sort of break it off to the shape that you need for your particular computer or power supply. So you get that basic kit, and then you also get the connector that goes uh, to the Apple III motherboard. And the cool thing is you just drop it in. Uh, once you close it up again, no one can see, in fact, that you have done that. So um, it looks just like a normal Apple III, but you don't have to worry about uh, the smoke. Uh, and it's not, it's not hard to install. So there's a little bit of um, sort of like pushing things into these little um, wire units. Uh, Stu has a really pretty nice uh, video about installing this in an Apple III. So, and, and this actually, should, I did not open mine up. Uh, I had put mine together a while ago, uh, and I didn't open it up to film it, but Stu did a good job of that, so go take a look at that. The other thing, another you know aspect of the Apple III is that um, the Apple III is actually a color machine, and a lot of people actually find that sort of surprising, because all of the pictures you ever see of the Apple III, yeah, they're showing some sort of like spreadsheet in green screen. But however, um, the Apple III is a color machine and it's actually a pretty nice color machine. It has some extra um, color modes and things. So it has, a, the, you know, one of the sort of maybe sort of most striking ones is this 24 by 80 color text, which has 16 foreground and 16 background colors. Uh, but there's some other ones. So 560 by 192 is, is relatively big. Um, 140 by 192 with 16 colors anywhere. So uh, regular sort of high-res high res, um, resolution, but with 16 colors at any point on the screen. There's also some slightly more uh, limited modes, 280 by 192 with 16 colors or grays, depending on what you're outputting. And then uh, one of the big things is that the character set is in RAM. So, uh, okay, I've turned everything blue. <laughs> But anyway, um, so you can download you can download new character sets, which means you can actually use them for graphics. You can do uh, things like running horses. You can do things like uh, Ultima-like games or whatever. Okay, so how do you see this nice color? Uh, well, okay, the problem is that uh, the way you see the color, the best way to do it is to use this sort of digital RGB output port that they've got. Um, the canonical way to do that is to view it with an Apple Color Monitor 100. These are really, really rare. These are really hard to get. Um, they're cool, but they're hard to get. They're super heavy. Um, the Apple II GS monitor can be put in a mode where it kind of works, but it uh, gets the colors wrong. So it's not great. Um, not, there's, no, there's no great solution to this yet. Um, seems like there could be, but no one, you know, no one, not enough people care about the Apple III. Uh, there is a, comp a composite video out. For some reason, it's monochrome. It doesn't actually output the color. Why is that? I don't know. However, uh, on that little RGB output port, it turns out that they don't need all those pins. So uh, they have on 12, they have a color composite, and on um, 11, they have a mono composite. So if you actually plug something into that and pull out the color composite signal, you can get a composite signal and 
you can buy uh, from retrofloppy.com. Exactly that thing. It converts you from this, um, you know, the, this thing that will plug into the uh, the port in the back. Uh, but of course, you know, ultimately, it's only using those two pins, uh, and so you can get it. Uh, I have one. I've tried it. It works nicely. Uh, once you've got it going out to composite, then you can do something like this. So uh, I have had pretty good luck. I will show this in a second. But I've had pretty good luck with the AB2 HDMI adapter. Looks like this. Many places sell this. Uh, I think they are just equivalent on Amazon. Uh, it costs very little. Uh, but uh, you can, uh, you know, it has the standard sort of VCR looking RCA components. You can put in uh, the composite input here on the yellow. You can switch it between 720 and one, uh, 1080p. And on this other end, there is an HDMI. And then I send that HDMI out of this little box into one of these little HDMI capture boxes. So uh, HDMI input comes in. Uh, there's an output that can send it off to a TV if you want to want to, and then it comes through a USB 3 port into a computer. I have this running, so let's just see if I can let's see if I can do a new share. That would be interesting, would it not? Um, I think a new share would look like this. Let's try that. There we go. That is my actual Apple III. It is right there. Uh, okay, so uh, as you can see, uh, there's a bit of a delay, actually. Well, that's not so great. But uh, nevertheless, this looks good, right? I mean, like, this looks quite good. You can totally read it. Um, anyway, it did, it did pretty well. Um, there, was, there was lag that, uh, you know, whatever, my computer's working hard. Uh, but it looks not too bad. So particularly if, there's, if you're not trying to simultaneously, you know, play a game or whatever, it's not bad. Uh, okay, next thing. Internal floppy drive. So uh, the thing about the Apple III is that it has an internal floppy drive built in. This. And uh, it, the ROM is set up to necessarily boot from that drive. It has a little, you know, basically ProDOS uh, DOS 3.3 compatible RWTS built in to the ROM, and it uses that to bring in the boot code. So no matter what you do, you have to start from the internal floppy drive, unless you replace the ROM, which we'll talk about. But um, yeah, so short of replacing the ROM, you have to boot from the internal floppy drive, even if you have a hard drive, even if you have a profile or whatever. Um, interestingly, the, the two and three drives are essentially the same. Uh, the analog board is different, so there's a couple of different things that the Apple III can do. You can chain disks together and so forth. Um, that means there are a couple of extra pins on the Apple III connector. But uh, you can, it is possible to, if you basically ignore those pins, to use an Apple II drive on a 3. And so there are a couple different places that you can or could get these, these adapters. Um, uh, Charles sold them through Retro Connector for a while. This, is, this one on the left is one of Charles's. Uh, and then uh, Vintage Micros sells these on eBay, uh, even though there's a Vintage Micros site. I don't see it there. But um, so essentially what it is, is just, uh, it's a disk two on one side, actually this side, this gray side, and, and then it's a disk three plug on the other side. You can see that basically it's just sort of ignoring some of the pins on the disk three side. You can also get a long one. So Vintage Micros will send, sell either type of these, the short or the long one. And uh, I have both, but the long one is the one that is of most use because you can actually take that, you can actually get that to come out of the machine. So I will show what I did with that. Uh, once you can, once you have this possibility to plug in an Apple II thing, we have all these little emulators for Apple IIs, right? So uh, perfect. We can now use these, the little, the floppy emu, we can use the W drive, we can use the SD floppy two and other ones, um, Unis disks and so forth. So as long as you don't need, you know, the, the change disk detection or the detection or the chaining, um, you can use these. Uh, this is probably the new newest new part. I mean, like, so this, 
being able to use an Apple II drive on an Apple III, that's old news, really. But um, there is this new format that comes with the applesauce, or that sort of arose with the applesauce, which is the WAS format, and that is a way to um, basically encode flux-level images. So it's a slightly processed version of a flux image, and there now are increasing numbers of little emulators and things that use can use the WAS format. So this, what I have a picture of here is the W drive, and that can use the WAS format. And, you know, it's most people think of it as being for the Apple II, but of course uh, it now works on the Apple III with one of these adapters. So you can use a WAS image on the Apple III, and that's good because Pirates ignored the Apple III. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that is copy protected and no one cracked it. No one knows how to crack it. I mean, like, how do you crack things on Apple III? Uh, it's, it will take work. And these, you know, bits are rotting. So now we can, not only, not only can we uh, image the, these protected disks with the applesauce thing, but we can actually just run them on an Apple III. Uh, okay, so beyond floppies, there are also mass storage. Uh, so like larger hard drives. Uh, the floppy emu uh, can emulate a three three and a half inch drive, and the um, Apple III could use the Apple II's Lyron card, the three and a half inch uh, floppy card. That works just fine in Apple III because actually Apple III's you know the electrical connections are are um, identical to the Apple II's. So, uh, in fact, you can use pretty much any card that fits in the Apple III that you could have used in the Apple II if you have a driver for it. Um, and of course, there are certain things that it's just kind of like impossible, like RAM cards and things, but. Uh, because actually the firmware that comes on a card is not sensed by the Apple III. However, if you write a driver for it, um, you can do that. So ON3 made a, a driver for the Lyron card. It was lost for a while, but has been recovered. And once you have that, uh, you know, the floppy emu is basically just emulating a three and a half inch drive and you can plug it into a Lyron card and there you go. So that, uh, that's mass storage <laughs> of the three and a half inch drive sort. Uh, however, uh, that can actually, that port can actually, I think, handle larger, um, larger devices. Uh, there's the CFFA2 card. Uh, this is the predecessor to the CFFA3000 card. Either of those will work fine in the Apple III. Uh, and in fact, actually they work basically the same in the Apple III. So um, to the extent that the CFFA2 is less desirable than the more modern CFFA 3000, neither of which are made anymore, uh, you might be able to get a CFFA 2 for less. Uh, and if you're going to use it in Apple III, that's fine. You you don't need the firmware. You don't need the USB or the remote, really, in the uh, um, Apple III. So, uh, so that's good. Uh, I used one in my Apple III for a while. I'm looking over here because that's where my Apple III is. But... Um, Okay, there's a new one, uh, the Booty. Uh, this is a tiny, tiny little card. Um, it has a USB connector, uh, and it's, it comes in these two pieces, so this piece fits onto that piece. Um, and Rob Justice has been working on a, a like mass storage block driver um, that works fine with this and with the CFFA and so forth. Um, I'll talk more about that at some point, I think. Uh, but uh, the external USB drive is pretty cool. Um, and actually, what I've done here is I've got an extender that goes from this USB port um, out to the out, uh, external so I can just sort of plug a flash drive into it. Um, this is David Mutimer's um, creation. Uh, he's in Australia, but uh, Chris Torrance is handling the US ordering. So if you want to get one, he will know, Chris will know how. Uh, if you want to get one in Australia, David will know how. Um, I don't think I don't know if to what extent they are currently available, but um, but I think they are intended to be available in the future. So um, they're very nice, they're very cute. Um, another thing that's sort of new and recent is that um, Rob Justice has been working on a revised ROM that will actually allow you to boot from a hard drive. So that thing, you know, the thing I was complaining about about how you need to boot from that thing, wherever it is here. Um, this is finally a solution to it, uh, although it does require replacing the ROM. But uh, it has been tested by a couple of people. Uh, Jorma, I think, tested it uh, and seems to work. Uh, it's replacing some of the self-testing diagnostics, but otherwise. Um, so take a look at that. Um, that will be um, that will be that will be soon available. And actually, uh, even without that, there uh, he's got a pretty cool thing which 
will boot just a little tiny bit from the floppy drive before going off and booting the rest of the way from a hard drive, uh, which is actually pretty useful because uh, drivers take up a lot of space. Um, and so I, I'm always running out of space on my disks <laughs> for, the, for the drivers that you want to load. Um, so it's actually pretty nice to, to not have to worry about that by putting it all on the hard drive. Um, so that's cool. Another thing that is really pretty nifty is that the um, there a couple of years ago I don't know I'm not sure actually how long ago but uh, somebody noticed that you could uh, tack one of these little little you know sort of Wi-Fi receivers onto uh, sort of a regular 25 pin RS232 device and you would have a modem that goes over Wi-Fi so. The first one that I became aware of was one that Paul Rickards made, uh, the Wi-Fi 232. Um, I have one of these somewhere. I don't. I, I didn't bring it home with me, but uh, I, I have one of those. The one I have at home is the Guru Modem 232. Uh, that's electronics is fun. Um, that's this one up here in the corner. Uh, and uh, we'll hear actually a little bit more in Kansas Fest about why Modem 232 um, from CBM stuff. Uh, so that's these three pictures here, um, but they all—they all sort of essentially have the same function, which is that you plug them in to an RS-232 port, usually something that would be expecting a modem or something, and you can then talk to—you know—you can talk a little bit to the little Wi-Fi connector, uh, which will then let you get out to the internet and connect. Right. So um, I will—I I hope to—I'll I'll talk a little bit about what I've done with this. Um, so one obvious thing you can do is plug this in and then call a Telnet BBS, right? The Apple III doesn't know whether you're, you've got a modem on the other end or not. So, it, you know, you can, you can type essentially like, you know, ATDT internet address port, right? And it will go do that. Um, I actually did something which I think was very cool. Um, I don't have a very good demonstration of it, but I will tell you about it. Um, maybe I can drop in a photo of it somewhere or something. But um, the... Guru modem, and I think also the uh, this Wine modem 232, uh, has an answer mode so that you can actually sort of like run a BBS on it if you wanted. Uh, and so what that mean and what that means is that it will sit on a internet address and it will wait for a connection and then it will make the connection. Um, and I was successful in setting the modem into answer mode, setting uh, the TCP serial to connect to it so that my Mac was basically talking to, um, it was it was talking over this, uh, it was it believed it was talking to a serial connection, but it was being sent over TCP. That's what TCP sir does. Um, uh, so what I did was I went into a terminal program on the Apple III to set the baud rate to something high. Um, I think it was 115, whatever it is, the 115, 900 or whatever it is, the, the high one, 200. Um, ADT Pro can be bootstrapped then uh, over a Wi-Fi connection because I, I point ADT Pro to this serial going over the wireless to the modem on the Apple III and it worked. So I had no cable but I had a modem uh, and so as long as you have a terminal program that lets you talk to your uh, modem at least. Uh, I had to do a little bit of tinkering with the startup script. Maybe I'll put that in information somewhere but uh, what essentially what I had to do was uh, for the ADT Pro startup script was uh, force it to look for uh, a particular serial uh, connection because it wasn't automatically looking for that. Um, but anyway, anything that connects to serial uh, works with this. Another thing that's kind of cool that I've tried uh, is it's possible to get these Flash Air uh, SD cards. So uh, the Unisdisk Air was the first one that I was aware of um, that, that actually um, used this thing. And basically what it is is an SD card that has a Wi-Fi um, connection of its own, so that you can you can basically connect to this uh, SD card and send send and receive files. So this is you know people got these for their cameras, so they can download the photos you know without having to plug something in. But uh, this is great for these little you know these little um, devices, so you can so you can uh, send your disk images to like you know the like the W drive thing for example, um, and then it's there. You don't have to you don't have to actually take the thing out and uh, um, you know plug it into your computer. Um, it's kind of cool. I suppose it's uh, it's actually getting kind of hard to find these, and it's possible that that's because its coolness um, is not actually matched by its practicality. <laughs> 
So um, it's kind of neat, but it's it's a little bit of a pain. Um, in the context of the um, flash air card, this is particularly useful, I think, for the um, 2C because I think you can bury the thing inside the 2C, so it's a pain to actually get the thing in and out. But uh, Ethernet, uh, another modern thing. So um, the Ethernet 2 card, it's still possible to get this, atretrosystems.com. Um, I have one that's, that looks a little older than this, um, but uh, so I've got this in the in the Apple III. Uh, ADT Pro is capable of using it. Um, I haven't actually tried it. Plasma, uh, which is David Schmink's programming language um, that targets Apple IIs, Apple III's, and Apple I's actually too, uh, it also is capable of using the um, Ethernet 2. So this is another thing that, that uh, you know, sort of a modern connection that you can use in the three. Um, and then the last point is just emulation. Um, emulation has come a long way recently. It's it's actually pretty pretty easy now to get an Apple III running. Um, there was this, the story with emulation was essentially that there was no good emulator up until about 2014, sometime. Um, and that was actually sort of what prompted Mike McGinnis and I to start this Drop Three Inches uh, podcast. Was that suddenly it was you know possible to <laughs> use these? Um, and it was it was possible for people who didn't actually have one of these heavy Apple Threes to to explore them. Um, so a lot of this has to do with Arby, uh, this person who works on the main project, uh, who has been very sort of diligent in trying to get the Apple IIs and Apple IIIs working. Uh, but so I'll possibly do a little screen share showing that. But um, at any rate, the, the way that you can use the emulation is um, easiest way is through this Apple III ready to run. So Egan Ford created this. Uh, he created that quite a while ago, um, you know, so for an older distribution of MAME. But uh, in fact, actually, it's still pretty much works. You can uh, you can go to it, um, download it. Uh, it will come with an old version of MAME, but you can compile a more recent version. Uh, it comes with a hard drive that you know uh, that will work, but uh, there are other possibly more recent versions that you could use. So uh, MAME itself comes from MAME dev slash MAME. Uh, if you want to make just the Apple III drivers, you can do that. Um, here is a command line that will do it. Uh, you can also download a binary for Macs, um, SDL meme. Uh, and then the Apple III are ready to run site um, is here at data jerk Apple III RTR. Um, it's very nice, very useful. Um, one thing that I discovered was that uh, when I tried this a couple days ago, yesterday, sometime, uh, I accidentally left full screen on and lost control of my Mac entirely. <laughs> Like uh, the Apple III went full screen, and then I, then I, uh, it was clearly still functioning somehow, but I could not tell. I couldn't SSH in. I couldn't do anything. So, I would say uh, put it in window mode rather than full screen, so you at least have a chance of getting control back. Um, another thing that I wanted to try, I've not tried this, but uh, it is, it it was done in the past to drop 65802s in place of the 6502 that is inside the Apple III. Um, it's apparently a little bit. Uh, temperamental. So some 65802s worked and some didn't. The 65802 is basically the 65816, but in a slightly different shape. Um, A2 Heaven makes a 65816 drop-in replacement for the 65CO2, and that's intended to put in the 2E, but I suspect, I suspect that it's going to work in the Apple III. Um, I have a couple of 65802s. I have not tried them. I have one of these 65816 uh, adapters. I have also not tried that. I could not find it when I was looking. Um, otherwise, I would have tried it. Then, I guess the other thing that you know, the other thing with the Apple III in 2020 is that uh, there's some software development going on. A lot of it done by uh, Rob Justice, uh, that I've mentioned already. Um, David Schmidt has been very sort of careful to make sure that ADT Pro, as it continues up, has always remained Apple III compatible. David Schmink uh, is working on Plasma and actually has just a new version of that released recently. Um, so we have stuff that we, uh, you know, we have what we need to get started. Um, and I guess sort of just to sort of close off the presentation part here, um, the point I basically wanted to make was that uh, it's getting easier and easier to do things with the Apple III. And I really think that this is a machine that had a lot of unexplored potential. Um, it kind of, it took too long for the developers uh, to get the stuff that they needed to develop. So, uh, and it, and the initial release of the Apple III was not, didn't go so well. Uh, and so uh, basically people didn't, you know, people had moved on by the time uh, they would have been exploring what the Apple III could do, even though it has all this, it's a little faster, it has these nice graphics, it's, you know, has lots of memory. 
but um, you know, almost everything that you actually see these days about like how to use the Apple III, uh, they show you how to start the Apple II emulator, and you know, what, what good is that? Um, but anyway, so uh, no more fear of Magic Smoke uh, ability to boot off Flash Media and possibly also the um, the you know off of you know directly without having to floppy altogether. You can do uh, various uh, wireless things. Um, it's relatively easy to get the color signal out of the composite, and it looks relatively good. Uh, and now that we have uh, little little devices that can use WAS formats, we can copy protected disks and so forth. Uh, okay, here's the Apple III. It's actually an Apple III Plus. Uh, okay, uh, that's the uh, W drive that I'm gonna. Um, so here's what I did. Uh, I I took this long cable. That's the re the um, vintage micros cable, and I plugged it into. I plugged this W drive into the long cable, and then I put that in place of the um, internal drive. This is me opening up the Apple III, um, and here we have the back. Uh, okay. So this now has no screws, so I can just sort of pull that out a little bit, and you can see uh, we have, so um, I think it's the keyboard, and then this right there is the internal drive. So I'm, I'm taking that out, and I'm going to, I'm gonna route these a little bit, and then I'm going to put the W drive in that spot. Um, so what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm actually going to I'm going to actually route that outside so that it can be so that this internal drive can be drive two so that I actually have at least some place that I can get drive two. Um, okay, so you can see I've routed it out there, and so now I'm putting everything back in. Screws all go back in. Dum -de dum dum. Okay. Uh, right. Now uh, this is an Apple three plus. And the connector is actually different on an Apple III Plus to an Apple III. So you need this one little adapter. This is actually a real Apple adapter. Um, and I'm just using this thing that I routed out and I'm plugging it into the external drive too. So now the internal drive in the front is going to behave as if it is drive two. And I've lost all ability to daisy chain, but whatever. Um, if I wanted to, I could uh, deal with that in some way. Okay. So uh, there we go. Uh, okay, now, so now I am, I think, demonstrating booting off of the, oh, yes, so here, this is, this is me being puzzled and sad, uh, saddened by the fact that um, I actually broke something in the little uh, regular composite output in the 3 plus, so I'm going to have to deal with that. It's, uh, it kind of broke free, so um, I could, I can turn it in just the right direction and angle it so that it will, um, uh, it will actually make the connection. So I will, I will do that. Uh, I will show this working as I hold it. <laughs> but I did successfully boot off the W drive. Okay, that's nice. Cool. Uh, okay, so now I'm just going to put in some various cards. The cards I'm going to put in, uh, this is the Microsoft soft card. There it is. Okay, so I will put that in. Uh, okay, it's actually that's actually a little bit difficult to put in. Uh, and then I will put in, I think the, probably the Lyron card is next. No, nope, the booty. This is the booty card. All right. I'll put that in. Uh, and I will route the USB extender there. Uh, I will put the Lyron card in. Lyron card. All right. And I put that in. Uh, this is the Ethernet card. I will put that in, um, and then I will route uh, the Ethernet cable out. And I think that's basically it. Uh, oh, oh yeah, and I'll, I'm, I'm plugging the uh, floppy emu into the back of the layer card. Okay. Uh, actually, I think right now what I'm trying to do is figure out how to get the screen to work, because that screen on the older ones is a little flaky, but uh, okay, anyway, uh, basically worked, so now time to close it up. Uh, all right, that's the end of my little movie. Thanks, enjoy the rest of your Kansas Fest. See you.